Here we're going to start looking at some of the special senses like taste and smell and then in a second video we'll look at vision and I just want to point out kind of a couple differences um, between these types of sensations. So for taste and smell um, the type of receptive endings we're going to be finding are all called chemoreceptors. This means that the receptive endings actually bind to chemicals in order to receive that sensation. And then when we look at vision, we're going to be looking at photoreceptors, which are receptors that are able, able to pick up little photons or wavelengths of light. So starting first with smell. Smell is also known as olfaction, and it's the olfactory neurons that do this job. And what they're responding to are called odorants. Odorants would be the types of chemicals and things that are aerosolized into the air so that it can be inhaled through, for example, our nose and actually hit these neurons. So what we're looking at here is a nasal cavity. We're just seeing half of it. So like maybe we are at the midline and we're looking out at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And in the nasal cavity, at the very roof of it is where you have, this is actually the bottom of the brain case. So this bone right here, I'm gonna to try to trace it. This bone is, actually it's the bones right here. This bone right here is the broad, bottom of the brain case. If you remember um, the ethmoid bone, um, in our skull models, it was a bright yellow bone that actually sealed the very bottom of the brain case. And so if you remove the ethmoid bone, you might worry that your brain might leak out. Haha, <laughs> not really. But um, it, this is what seals the bottom of the brain case. And through the olfactory, or I'm sorry, through the ethmoid bone, the sensory neurons actually um, go through these little tiny foramen. So you can't see them in the picture here, but these guys have to be passing through the bone. So they're passing through little tiny holes in the bone. And then these are their sensory endings um, that are kind of poking out. So they're actually inside the nasal cavity where an aerosolized chemical would be able to interact with them. The other idea is all along here is going to be coated with a mucus layer. So as these little olf um, olfactory chemicals come in through the nasal passage, they might get stuck in this mucus and thus be able to interact with these sensory receptive endings. So right above um, where these guys enter, you see the olfactory bulb, and then you see the olfactory nerve, which extends back and enters the brain. We can see some of those details a little better in this picture. Here again, we're seeing the nasal cavity, and here are those neurons at the roof of the nasal cavity. You can also see that ethmoid bone a little bit better, and you can imagine that these little neurons are um, sending uh, their axons through holes in this, olfact in, in this um, ethmoid bone. You can see that even better over here where you see those axons extending through these holes or these foramen inside the bones. So the neurons that are olfactory neurons are considered bipolar neurons. That means that they have their cell body in the middle and then they have a receptive dendritic ending going one way and then the axonal ending extending the other. And so that's what we're seeing in this picture. So here we're seeing the cell body of a bipolar neuron and there's its dendritic ending extending down into the nasal cavity where it'll be in a mucus layer. And then um, its other ending, its axonal ending, goes through the ethmoid bone um, to join with those uh, other axons and extend toward the brain as the olfactory nerve. Another characteristic of these cells is that they have these cilia at the receptive ending. So these receptive endings are called the dendritic ending or the receptive endings. And they have these cilia, which just gives them more surface area to have um, the receptors that we're going to be seeing in the next picture. So the, at these endings will be receptors that can bind to those chemicals that get stuck in the mucus. Another thing about these olfactory neurons is that they're constantly being replaced. And this is extremely rare for neurons. Usually you don't replace neurons if you lose them. But lost olfactory neurons are replaced by these basal cells. So in this picture here we can see a basal cell. It looks a little different than the epithelial cell. So this is a typical epithelial cell and they're kind of stacked all next to each other. It looks like a simple columnar epithelium with some of these bipolar sensory neurons scattered among them. And then also scattered in will be these basal cells, which are cells that can replace the olfactory neurons as needed. So if we zoom in on these cilia, so here we're going to zoom in on the cilia 
at the end of the bipolar neurons. So these cilia um, are membranous, right? So they're part of the membrane. So here if I kind of draw, there's a dendrite going back up. These are all extensions of the cellular membrane. So in this picture, we're going to first draw the cellular membrane as this phospholipid bilayer. So you recognize that part. And then in this membrane, so actually inside this membrane, like we're, so, as if we've got this little piece here, um, we're looking at this membrane. There are these big old olfactory receptors. And these olfactory receptors, they're the ones that are going to be binding the odorant. So here's the odorant, some sort of chemical in the air, and it will match to and bind to the olfactory receptor. So we can kind of see here there's a shape. Um, to the odorant molecule, so any chemical will have a molecular shape, and then the receptor has a molecular shape that may or may not bind. You have more than 400 different receptors like this. What I mean by that is each one has a very uh, peculiar shape that's unique to each of them so that they bind specific shapes of molecules for the, the chemicals that they are able to bind to and thus sense. So each receptor can actually bind multiple odorants, and that's because some of these molecules may have similar moieties or similar aspects to them. So some of the chemicals can look um, or be shaped very similarly and be able to bind to a similar uh, receptor. So each receptor can actually bind multiple odorants. And also the odorants can sometimes bind multiple types of receptors. So what we're going to be looking at for each type of smell is that it's a different combination of receptors that get activated. The other thing that's interesting about these receptors is they're not straight up channels. So this odorant receptor is not a channel, but it is linked to a channel. So here's our channel over here. And it's linked to it by what's called G protein coupled signaling. So we um, call this receptor a G protein coupled receptor, which means that this receptor is coupled to these G proteins. And how that works is when the odorant binds the G protein linked receptor, when it binds here, these G proteins diffuse away and basically it's kind of like a domino effect. Something binds here and then the little G proteins get busy. And here we're seeing one activates another, then one diffuses away. So here goes little G protein alpha and it um, helps to phosphorylate CAMP, cyclic AMP. And in any case, this little domino effect leads to opening of an ion channel. So we're not directly opening the ion channel, but we are opening an ion channel indirectly via G protein coupled receptor. And then when you open the ion channel over here, so that's shown in pink, then these ions, per, for example, sodium, would be able to rush in, bringing in that positive charge and making the cell instead of negative 70, something more positive, which might cause it to depolarize and have an action potential. Another thing about odorant and their receptors is that the receptors adapt quickly. That means that after a receptor responds to an odorant, it won't respond again for a while. And you've experienced this anytime you walk into a room and you first you, you walk in and you go, ooh, something smells good or something smells bad. But within a few, uh, usually within a minute, you no longer really smell that. And that's because of adaptation. These sensory receptors, they basically, they respond once and then they kind of stop responding because they've already initiated that response. So the axons of these olfactory neurons actually pass through these foramen. I've talked about that a couple times now. So these little holes, and this is the ethmoid bone. Specifically, it's the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone. Um, so the bottom of the brain case. So these axons go through there. And here they're going to synapse with, these are the endings of the olfactory neurons inside the um, olfactory bulb. So if these guys um, pick up a, a, a chemical sensation at their receptor, there's an action potential that travels through this bipolar neuron and causes neurotransmitters to be released to these green neurons, or the neurons shown in green here. Sometimes there could be little interneurons in between mediating this, but ultimately it will then cause an action potential in these axons of the olfactory tract. Um, so the um, olfactory nerve, um, once it enters the brain, will get renamed the olfactory tract.
So the olfactory tract extends to what's called the olfactory cortex inside the brain. The whole olfactory nerve is called the first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve. Um, but then once it enters the brain, it's called the olfactory tract. So it's a nerve while it's out in the periphery, it's a uh, tract once it enters the brain. Um, and then this will map to an area of the brain. Um, the olfactory cortex is it within what's called the insula of the brain. So the insula of the brain, if we were to take the temporal cortex and kind of grab hold of it and pull it down, there's a little bit of tissue on the other side of it because um, where that temporal lobe is, there's all of this inner surface area here which is the insula, and that's where the um, olfactory cortex is. An interesting thing about smell sensation is it's one of the few um, sensations that goes directly to the cortex. So all the sensations are going to map to an area of the cortex. That's why sometimes we say, oh, yeah, this area of the cortex is for bodily sensations. This area is maybe vision and, and so on. And we kind of map different areas of the cortex like that. But most of the sensations will pass through the thalamus. Any sensation that we're conscious of typically passes through the thalamus. But these olfactory neurons are an exception. They map directly to the cerebral cortex without first sending an impulse to the thalamus. So that's kind of unusual in terms of sensation that we're conscious of. Okay, so that gives us an idea about olfaction. The other sensation we're going to look at here is taste. And taste, the more fancy name for taste, is gustation. Um, and so um, for taste, we have taste buds, but I think the taste buds may not be um, exactly as you had pictured them. So what we're, or, you know, as you had thought of them before. So what we're looking at in this picture, this is the tongue, and on your tongue, you have all of these bumps. Well, these bumps are called papillae. The bumps themselves are not directly the taste buds. The taste buds are within the bumps, the papillae, but within one papillae, you might have multiple taste buds. Another thing that you might not have realized about taste buds is they're not just on your tongue. They're also on the palate, which is the roof of the mouth. You have a hard palate, and then you have a soft palate back behind it or posterior to it. And then um, in your throat, or you have what's called the epiglottis. And on all of these throat structures, we also have uh, taste sensation or taste buds, um, particularly the taste hairs within these buds, which will pick up taste sensation. And you might have known this. Um, this is something that I still try to trick my kids with, and I think that they still believe me. And possibly maybe your parents tricked you, and maybe you still believe this as well. But I always tell my kids, you know, when I have to give them bad tasting medicine, I tell them, oh, if you just throw it to the back of your tongue and bypass your your or throw it to the back of your throat and bypass your tongue, you won't taste it. And we know that that's not true because you do actually taste it. Even if your tongue never um, contacts the tastant, you will still taste it because within your throat, there are these structures that actually have taste buds. So there's no way around it. If you're going to be swallowing it, you're going to be tasting it. Okay, so within the papillae, we have these taste buds. And within a taste bud, so here we're going to zoom in on one of these taste buds. Within these taste buds, we have these specialized epithelial cells, um, uh, which are called the taste cells. So in this picture, we're seeing um, here is a taste cell in this pink color. So this is a taste cell, and then you can see a couple others next to them. The taste cells are basically specialized epithelial cells which are going to have receptors um, to pick up the chemical tastants. And when they pick up that chemical tastant, they'll then release neurotransmitters to these um, nerve fibers, to these sensory neurons that are synapsing with these little taste cells. So... For the taste cells, there are five major tastants that they may have um, the correct receptor to pick up. So in this picture, we're seeing the taste cell a little better. So here's the taste cell. And at the tip of it, it has these little um, uh, membranous extensions that kind of look like cilia. They're called the taste hairs. And you're going to have these receptors are going to be concentrated in these um, taste hairs.
And the types of receptors that you may have here would be specialized to pick up one of the five major uh, taste ins. And so you would have a different taste hair, um, or I'm sorry, a different taste cell to pick up each of these. Um, and so um, they might have different combinations of these receptors on them. So the five major taste ins are salt, sour, sweet, bitter, and then the last one is called umami. And umami means savory. It's typically related to things like that contain amino acids, um, such as glutamate being one of the amino acids. Uh, bitter sensations, or I'm sorry, taste ins and sweet taste ins, all of these are acting through G protein. So very similar to what we saw with the olfactory receptors as far as the receptor binds to the G protein, which then, uh, or I'm sorry, the um, tastant binds to the receptor, which then interacts with the G proteins, and those G proteins go off and open an ion channel, which causes the cell to depolarize. For these first two, though, sour and salty, so sour is related to acidic things, which is related to H plus ions. So for sour sensations, those H plus ions in the food itself actually go through ion channels um, and, and cause other channels to open, uh, depolarizing the cell. For salt, it's also similar. Sodium ions will diffuse directly through those channels, directly depolarizing the cell. So these taste ins will bind to receptors that are at the hair cell, causing this entire um, taste cell to depolarize and release neurotransmitters here to a sensory neuron that um, has dendritic endings right next to it. These neurons with the dendritic endings right next to the taste cells, um, they are part of either the 7th cranial nerve, the ninth cranial nerve, or the 10th cranial nerve. And we can see those down in this picture. So this is those axons from the 7th cranial nerve getting innervation from taste or getting um, neuro, receiving neurotransmitters from the taste cells of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And here we can see the um, sensory nerves of the ninth. Um, cranial sensory nerve picking up neurotransmitters released by the taste cells of the um, posterior one-third of the tongue. And then we can see here the vagus nerve, um, the tenth nerve, picks up um, neurotransmitters that are being released by taste cells at either the epiglottis or various regions at kind of the throat. And each of these nerves then brings um, an action potential into um, the brain. And so we can see where these each enter into the brain via the brain stem. So this is these nerves as they enter into the brain. And once they enter the brain, they're no longer going to be called nerves. They will continue as tracks within the brain. And so here we can see that. Here's um, the 10th cranial nerve coming in and the 7th cranial nerve I'm sorry, the ninth coming in, and then here's the seventh cranial nerve coming in. They each are first um, will synapse with a, um, a neuron within the nucleus solitaris. So this is within the brain stem. But then that neuron will send an impulse directly to the thalamus, which will then stimulate a thalamic neuron. So once again, that thalamus is our center of awareness for um, sensory stimuli. And then that thalamic neuron will send an action potential to um, here we're seeing this is the gustatory cortex. And so you can see also in this picture very well the insula of the brain. So here we had the olfactory cortex, and on the other side we have the gustatory cortex. So each of these are in that insula region of the brain, which is otherwise really tricky to see because it's kind of under that temporal lobe that kind of hangs down and covers it and makes it so you can't see that it's folded up within there. Uh, but so this is for... Um, smell and taste, they each map to different areas of the brain, but they're each G protein, typically G protein coupled receptors that initially pick up those chemicals uh, in the environment.